I think when I, I saw this topic, beautiful art of pediatric practice, I, I was wondering what exactly that means. And I thought the best way is to look at what beauty means, what the art means, and what practice means. And once we go further, then we know probably where we stand. And I think uh, art uh, really refers to uh, using skills. Are we focusing the slides? So as I was talking about that, the uh, art, really, art really refers to the uh, using skills with imagination. And I think uh, this is a special faculty of creativity which is endowed upon humans by nature. And I think that's what we need to use when we are talking about the art of practice. Well, practice means uh, really just perform repeatedly to acquire perfection. <clears throat> and we all know that medical uh, practitioners never become perfect. That's why we keep on practicing through our life, almost like the lawyers do and the chartered accountants do, but many others seem to get perfection much ahead. And what does beauty mean? I, I think uh, when I looked at the neuropathological evidence of what beauty means, I was most surprised that it says that it really triggers a response in the frontal cortex that helps to reduce the stimulus. And you can imagine something of this kind that you see, you probably forget your pain, and uh, this is what the nature provides. So I feel that we, we must look at the beauty part of the art. And I think that needs to be really appreciated. Then only the medical practice probably becomes complete. Now, what is so common between medicine and art? We are talking about art of medicine. We always thought that medicine is science, but what is common with the art? I think they share many common goals, the artist and the medical practitioner or a physician. Both of us compete with what the nature has not done, we need to complete. And many times I'm sure that many illnesses get better by nature, but not always. When, when there is a fracture, uh, a doctor puts a plaster, and nature heals the bone, but not unless the plaster is put. So the plaster does not cure the fracture, but even if the nature cures the fracture, the practitioner needs to complete what the nature has done, without it, the nature would have failed. I mean, the same thing with the artist also. Artist imagines what nature probably wanted to project, and he projects what the nature's view would have been, or what nature had not completed. I think we are, both the artist and the medical practitioner need the same qualities of body, mind, and spirit. Unless you combine all that, you can't get a good artist, and so also probably you don't get a good physician. Well, when you talk about the body, the most important part of the body for the artist is the eyes. And I think uh, the eyes are able to observe very keenly. And not only that, to ferret tiny details from the jumble of facts. You can imagine the medical practitioner does exactly the same, that he also has to kind of have an ability to observe keenly and pick up small clues out of a jumble of facts that the patient comes with. And I think imagine, therefore, that if the artist needs the eyes and the ability to observe, the medical practitioner needs equally an ability to observe. And what observation demands is an attention. And therefore, what is attention? A state of receptiveness towards the object. An artist really focuses on the object and imagines what all things he can make out of the object. And I'm sure the medical practitioner must look at the same way an object, the patient, the part of the disease, organ, and look beyond what he cannot normally see. And I think that is how exactly even the physicians are often referred to as an attending physician. Well, what is attending physician? A physician who attends to his job and not just one who attends the hospital and signs and goes away. So uh, you can see how the artists and the medical practitioner have many, many common things and I think, uh, finally, medic is, medicine is an art of doing. And it must employ all the tools that you have. And what are the tools that the medical practitioner has? He has a knowledge, he has skills to uh, implement knowledge, and he has to have a character to feel compelled to use all that knowledge and skills. And I think unless you have that, and I think that's where probably medicine is an art as well, because there is so much common with the artists and a medical practitioner. 
Well, what does that mean, application of art to medical practice? I think it means that, that there has to be a thorough clinical skills leading to proper diagnosis, not only proper diagnosis, but with minimum tests and a rational therapy. After all, it's not your aim just to get the child all right. Your aim is to get the child all right with the best available tools, which means the minimum test. Today, the uh, indication of a CT scan may be just the availability of a brain and an availability of a scan. That is not the rational uh, art of medical practice. Well, finally, the job is done, but it could have been done in an artistic way, which means it could have been done in a much better way. And I think it says the integration of art with science, that offers a holistic care. Today we are talking about the holistic care and it needs a creative imagination of every physician. Unfortunately, these things are not taught in our medical curriculum, nor uh, we are taught by anyone. We just learn by ourselves. And I'm sure many of us have stopped learning because years ago I got a gold medal. Thereafter the gold has rusted and I still flout that gold medal on my letterhead. And I think that's where a need for updating and kind of putting art and science together makes a holistic care. I think that's the quality of care. It's not just getting rid of fever. That's not a science alone. But I think there is something much more to science. And I think that's what probably we are talking about here. Let's look at how was the past medical practice and what's the present like. I think in the last century, before uh, modern medicine really developed, all that physician could offer was just a personal attention with compassion and concern for the patient. And even that itself gave a lot of patients a comfort, if not cure. Today, with all that modern medicine has evolved in 21st century, we have a thrust on healthcare into an era of modernization with advanced medical technology and computerization. Well, that is very good because it allows us to see everything even beyond sight. But what has happened thereafter? that there is an indisputable depersonalization of patient care. Earlier, the physicians treated the whole family, not just the patient, not just the child. Today, we started treating diseases in a child. <coughs> when I was trained, we were taught to look at the whole child, and then we started treating the disease of the child. And thereafter, we are treating the tests of the child and the numbers of the child. When I was trained, the cholesterol of 225, 250 was acceptable and people led a very happy, normal life. Thereafter, anti-cholesterol medications came and you had to take them. So what was the best way? Bring down the normal cholesterol level so that all of us are at risk of heart attack and take anti-cholesterol medicine. We forgot the lifestyle that was responsible. We went by numbers and today we realize that those numbers mean very little in isolation. And I think that's where we have come up to. Today I see a child on the rounds to say, my resident says, sir, this is a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, sir, this child has come with fever and cough, but even a CT scan is normal. He's wondering why CT scan is normal in a child with cough, and he has not even thought that what is he looking in a CT scan if the fellow is coughing because of his pharyngitis, his CT scan of the chest is not going to show. The, but he is now well worse that if somebody is coughing, you just don't do a chest x-ray, you do a CT scan, you make much better interpretation. And I'm sure today, many tests are abnormal in people who are normal. And we need to define what is normality. At one time when I was trained, normality was defined as a clinical absence of abnormality by and large, and a very thorough clinical follow-up. Today, the definition of normality is a total absence of abnormality in every modern test. <coughs> So you have to be very sure that you look all right, but you may be diseased in every organ. And I think that is where probably we have moved into. Well, these are going to be a changing trends, and that's a challenge to all of us, that what I learned 45, 50 years ago is not true today. And I recall many instances where in an ascites, we tap the peritoneal fluid, collect it in a sterile bottle and give it intravenously thinking that we are losing proteins and why not give those ready-made proteins instead of getting some artificial proteins. I can, I can recall in 60s, a patient of tuberculosis who had cure, got cured and somebody else of a similar disease was not getting well 
we would draw the blood of that patient was, who was getting cured and inject that blood into another patient who was not getting cured. It was called as an R factor, a transfer factor. And the literature said, you transfer immunity from a patient who is getting cured to a patient who is not getting cured. <coughs> and the people had understood that it's not drugs and disease, it's the host immunity. And they didn't know what that immunity means. Not that we know today either. But then that time we didn't know even a T cell and a B cell. Today we have so many, so many CD cells. But even then, with all that modern advance, we have not progressed to implement it to the ultimate benefit of the community. And I think that's where the science keeps on lacking all the time. So what has happened really? It's a dynamic process and therefore we need to look at it. And we know that this is a really a tripartite inter interaction. It's the host and environment and the intruder. We know very little about the host except his name and age. We know nothing about the bacteria, virus, whatever we imagine. And we know how environment is changing so badly to give rise to multiple spectrum of clinical presentation. And I think that's a real challenge to the science. <coughs> and therefore, <coughs> we need to learn, relearn, unlearn. And I think this is a continued process. And that's why hopefully we are all here to kind of debate every issue <coughs> and try to understand much better. And every time you realize how little you know. And I think if you know how little you know, then you have known enough at least to get stimulated for making a change. And as I said already, we have a high dependency on test today. We have a misapproach. What is misapproach? I think misapproach is management first. If management fails, investigation next. If investigation fails, then you say, what is your symptom and sign? I have never asked. Why, is, why am I not getting you cured? So we have gone exactly the reverse way. And we feel that that's the way probably today medical practice is going. Well, super specialization is very good. But I strongly feel that a super specialist has to be an excellent generalist first. If he is not an excellent generalist, his super speciality is likely to harm the community at large. <clears throat> and I can imagine how a super specialist will see the most rare in most common condition. And I can imagine when I <coughs> showed a cow to an intern and asked him, what's this? And he said, cow. And I said, what differential diagnosis? He said, nothing. He was very sure it was cow. When I showed it to an MD, he said, sir, looks like cow, but I need to investigate and be sure. So he, was, he had been trained for an evidence-based medicine. He wanted a test to be sure it was cow. But when I showed a DM, who was a super specialist, he said, sir, there are many probabilities. I was impressed by his knowledge. I said, what all? He said that it may be an atrophied elephant. I said, wonderful, how do you say that? He pulled out a literature in 70s in Lancet on page so and so, and he showed me a report which looked like a cow. I was impressed about his literature knowledge. I said, what next? He said, it could be a hypertrophied goat. Again, there was an evidence to say that. He was talking with evidence. Then I said, what all? He said, many possibilities. Finally, I said, what about cow? He said, if all that is ruled out, it may be cow. <laughs> the point is that you have to a super specialist, which is an excellent generalist. And I'm sure today a neurologist cannot opine without a CT or MR. Or a cardiologist has left his stethoscope way behind and he has an echocardiogram or an angiography, etc. I don't think that is the right way. We need those people when the generalists fail. But we don't need them to discuss the common issues. And I think that's where probably we need to do that. <clears throat> what has art means really? It has a multiple facets. Of course, the basic components of art is skill planning, communication, and time management. Today, when you see 100 patients a day, you probably have enough time to make the parents sit in front of you pay you and say thank you. And he said, but sir, you have not examined my child. He says, no, but time is up. Because how can you see 100 patients in a span of short time and you can possibly just do a courtesy by asking him to sit and pay and say thank you. Now, that's how the quantity and quality cannot go together in medical practice. I think you will have to have a skill planning. As you go up the ladder, you don't need to see somebody who sneezes once in a while. You could pass that on to somebody junior. He's starving of work and you are tired of work. But you don't give up work and poor man doesn't get work. So he does something wrong. If two, three, three people come together 
and decide how to improve quality, I think today there is a need for a group practice. Because individual cannot maintain the quality at the cost of quantity. And you always give an excuse that, oh, everybody wants me to see the child. No, nobody wants you to see. Everybody feels you will do the job, but you know you won't. So it's much better to say that you go to somebody else and I'm responsible. And I think time has come to do that. Otherwise, we will not do that. <clears throat> well, art means a philosophy. And what is philosophy really? Just an intellectual pursuit of wisdom. What does that mean? Uh, it means a patient hearing. I'm sure we need to hear a patient, even the most illiterate, most uneducated mother, knows so much about what the child has, only for us to pick up those clues. And we must give an honest opinion. An honest opinion, maybe I don't know. But I don't know is okay, but I know how to know. And that's enough. It could be that I ask my colleague to know. And that's the way I help the patient, which means even if I don't know, I know how to help them. And I think the honest opinion explanation. I think explanation has to be on the form of ABC, accurate, brief, and clear. We need to have a non-ambiguous communication. And I think we need to learn how to be accurate, brief, and clear when we probably communicate. Well, I think the ethics are very important, and ethics is a good conduct. For example, respect patient views. When somebody's child is not getting well, the parents are agitated and then come back to you and say, sir, what's happening? I've come to you 10 times and nothing is happening. I think you don't have to shout back. And you need to respect that they're really agitated because you've not been able to give them what they expect. And I think never run down peers. It's not uncommon to see, oh, good that you just came in time. Another one day, you would have been dead. Okay, many times I recall my house physicians in the general hospital would say, sir, I don't know why this practicing pediatrician did not diagnose meningitis. Because on day one of meningitis, there's no meningeal signs. And my resident sees only a board-like neck rigidity in meningitis. So he thinks that that's the way the meningitis starts. He needs to know how uh, symptoms and signs in an early stage of the disease are very difficult to make out and only conscientious person with suspicion and with a good clinical follow-up can make that out. And we need to teach the youngsters that it's not a board-like neck rigidity that we see in a medical college coming with meningitis on day one. For example, for an undergraduate, malaria is a spleen in the right eye like fossa. To a diploma holder, it could be a spleen palpable, but you and me should diagnose malaria even without the spleen coming up. Now that's where the malaria differs at different levels and we need to understand how that is and therefore the ethics and of course culture, the organized and discipline. I'm sure none of our conferences start on time. Discipline. Okay. Look at the whole Western world. Discipline is so much. Okay. And I think is discipline costing us anything? No. It's just a kind of a culture that we need to really look at. And I think uh, we must uh, really have an intention to offer care, even if not cure. <clears throat> and I think this concept must be built up. How many things in medicine can be cured? If you really look at that, the surgical people thought that they cure many things. Today we know that if an obstructive uropathy or a posterior urethral valve is diagnosed antenatally and fulgurated at hour one of life, even then, ultimately the renal failure sets in by the time he's adolescent. Because the kidneys are already damaged nine months prior. And therefore, look at every surgical correctable procedure. Kasai's procedure came in for a biliary atresia, now only knowing that it only prolongs life and ultimately gets into a liver transplant. So even the surgeons can't cure. The physician hardly can cure. Many things nature cures. Surely we need help, help to help the nature to cure. But many things have remained incurable, even in modern science. But the care can always be given. And I think this care without even cure is worth it. And that's holistic care. What is holistic care really? When you have the holistic care, that's the human qualities of holistic approach, consists of body, mind, heart, and soul. If you put all together, what does it mean in medical practice? Body means knowledge. Of course, we must have adequate knowledge to implement the best of care and cure. And we must have a mind that is commitment, and a commitment that I will do best for my patient and the heart, the compassion. I must be compassionate and I should understand that a sufferer has a different way of thinking than a reliever. <coughs> and finally, the soul. I must have an inner conscience to be responsible to. 
and I must finally feel that I have done my duty even if I have failed in terms of outcome. And I think that is the holistic care. What does it mean simply? We need to not only work with brain but also with heart. And I think that is what today in a modern busy world we are probably more moving to use our brain alone. And if you ask me where the mind is, the anatomists don't know where the mind is. The physiologists don't know what's the connections of mind. So it's a kind of an imaginary organ, but it really does all that probably ultimately decide. It's my mind that decides whether I do my work well or not. It's suddenly I see something of a fearful nature. I, I suddenly have changes in my body. My mind reacts. Today we know that brain is totally controlled by the intestine and not just the brain, but even then we don't know where the mind is. And we know that intestinal hormones control the brain. And there is enough evidence that you see something fearful, something goes down in the tummy. And when you want to go for a practical viva, you go for a loo once more. And finally, when you ask me at the end of my talk, what makes you think this is right? I would say it's my gut feeling, not my brain feeling. Gut is beyond the brain and the mind, we don't know where it is. Imagine this modern science has failed to understand many things, but we know that it's not just the use of brain, but also heart. What's the present scenario? I think there's an erosion of medical profession. Today we are not well respected as probably our forefathers were. And why is that? Has the community changed? Maybe. But have the doctors changed and the medical professionals changed? Very much. <coughs> well, we, we every time say we are a part of the community. If community is getting corrupt, we are also getting corrupt. That's no answer. <coughs> because only those who would still stay clear in this mess of all wrongdoings are the only hopes for the country and the, for the community. <coughs> and I think we owe that to the community. So there's no reason my, to say that my next door doctor would have done the same. You will not do the same. If I think that's the way to look at. What do the patients expect? I think besides a rational approach to diagnosis and management, which is not, to my mind, very difficult because when it is difficult, it's difficult for all. And when it is simple, it can be simple for all. And therefore, what do they expect? They support, they expect support, guidance, and probably personal as care. <clears throat> Which means that we must make the parents feel that you are all for their child and you are concerned. I know that if you are bald, if you have got a big paunch, <coughs> and if you have piles, then you probably are the best physician. Because you are bald, the people feel you are most wise. Baldness is equivalent to wisdom. If you have a big pond, then you are prosperous. That means you must be having a good clientele, which means you must be good. And if you have piles, then you are uncomfortable sitting, so your gesture makes the parents feel that you are concerned with their problems. <clears throat> we don't want to do that. We can be without bald, the wisdom comes in, and without the piles, the concern. But I think that is where it is. And it improves the healing process. I remember many times that when there is a care given, there is much better response because the response is beyond our understanding. That's why the same drug, same disease, but different children behave differently. We say their immune system is different. Maybe. Who, who controls immune system? Maybe multiple such physiological reaction. And I think just making them feeling comfortable would do so much towards healing. Even when the disease refuse, refuses to heal, a patient starts healing as if. And I think that's important. But what do they get generally? They get the management of collection of symptoms and not even the patient. <coughs> and I think we give attention only to cure and not to prioritization. And we rarely have a consideration for care. And I think this care point of view is probably missing in cure. And we know that cure is many times even not possible. So science is important. There's no doubt at all. Without science, we would not have progressed. And we are all scientists, basically. But that's not the end of it. I think humanity of patient should not be overwhelmed by science. And I think that's, that's very, very important. I, I imagine formal exploration of this concept in medical practice, as well as in medical training, will probably contribute to a large extent in improving future of medical science. <coughs> Today, we, we are all aware that medical students are being taught something of this kind. It's so trivial. It's so in an infancy stage. But I think this needs to be imbibed. Where, where do we learn this from? We learn this from our parents. We learn this from our school teachers who probably molded most of us. 
And what do the medical teachers do? Nothing. They just polish to if at all. What can a medical teacher teach? The patients teach. Only if you had an eyes open and a brain to think. The medical teachers guide, but they don't teach. What we were taught by probably our parents and our school teachers. And I think it's time even today that the medical students may be started to teach because if these things are not taught earlier, then it's probably uh, at least better late than never. <coughs> and I think every practicing pedi pediatrician knows this. It's not that we are ignorant. We are aware of it. But for some reason, we fail to implement it <coughs> for whatever reasons we give. We give reasons to say we have no time. I remember Dr. Merchant, who was our teacher, always said that the most busy person has enough time. I said, how do you say that? He said, he has to manage time because he's busy. If you say I have no time, that means you are not busy. And I think we, we need to really look at how we can implement it. Well, lastly, I would end up by saying that what I've been talking about is the art of practice. And we said that art of practice is really a quality care. And we said that a care a must, a cure if possible. And what's the measure of our quality care? I think happiness more than success. I think success and happiness are two different things. The success is you, you get what you want at any cost. That's success. Many of us try to do that. But what happiness? I think what is it just opposite that? If success is you get what you want, happiness is you want what you get. If I get 10 patients, I'm happy because I'm able to do very good to those 10 patients. And those 10 patients bless me, bring me another 10. It multiplies. And I think that happiness is different than success. Surely we need to kind of combine both. But they are diametrically opposite. And therefore a wire media is not easy. But happiness is the priority, not the success. And what is the quality of care? If I miss a diagnosis, I should not lose a patient. <coughs> the parent should come again to me and said that, look, last time you missed a diagnosis, but I can know that you did your best. And if I lose a patient, then I should not lose a family. They should come with the next child only to me because they are sure that it was a destiny. The doctor tried hard. Doctor tried his best. I think we are not punished or we are not blamed for the outcome. We are blamed for the method to which we reached the outcome. And I think if I lose a patient, I should not still lose a family. If I lose a family, because the family may feel bad, embarrassed to come to me, I should not lose the community. I should not lose my practice. But finally, even if I lost that, I should not lose my conscience. I should know that I did my best, but I failed. That I failed was not in my control. But that I did my best was in my control and I did it. I think that's the art of practice. I would just end up by saying, let's try to emulate the art. We all know science, and we also know we don't know enough science. We can know enough art. We can implement enough art. Even if we mix that with a little science, I think the community will be benefited. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Beauty, they say, is in the eyes of the beholder. If you consider pediatrics, as a beautiful art and a science, I am sure it's going to give pleasure to both the patient as well as to us. Sir, with your words of wisdom, as usual, we have been listening to you for so long and your encouragement and the take-home message which I felt was, the days of one-man army are over. We need to get into a group kind of a practice and we need to practice medicine the way it should be practiced. There should be simplicity, but it should not, simplicism should not be there. Thank you very much. <laughs>